as a student, what was the first concept of quantum mechanics to appear hard for you to understand? I think the hardest one was complementarity. Complementarity, the, the, the how do you want to say, the dogma that you are, that you're not allowed to speak about position and momentum of a particle at the same time. Right? And of course then they tell you, well, this is because uh, these are observables, they don't commute, they are not measurable together, they talk about lots of different things that each of them makes a little bit of sense, but, uh, but it's very hard to swallow. I mean, it's something that, I mean, the first reaction that I had and probably everybody else in the class was, well, I mean, even if we're not, not allowed to talk about it, I mean, <laughs> you can still think about it, let's say, you know? Yeah. What does, I mean, what, what goes wrong with that? I mean, what's wrong with this idea that, that you know, secretly the particle might still have a positive <laughs> momentum? And, uh, and that, I mean, you kind of, you find yourself running against this over and over again, and you, and it's hard to understand in the beginning because you don't know enough of quantum mechanics to understand this. I mean, we, in, in our first year of quantum mechanics, we did not learn about Bell inequalities. I, I think, actually, I was teaching the lecturer later on about Bell inequalities in a seminar. He really didn't know about this before, which is really the explanation why why you cannot even contemplate uh, this complementary complementary uh, observables at the same time. But, but for me, this was really the, the biggest struggle. I mean, that's something that you know you learn to calculate. Of course, they give you all the all the rules how to solve equations and so yeah. on. But um, but what's yeah what is difficult is the conceptual bit you know you at some point they come out with this uncertainty relation they they start to interpret it you know this this complementarity business. But like, you, okay, I understand what you're saying, but mm. yeah, yeah, but you, uh, you you I mean the first reaction seems to be yeah, does it really have to be like this? I mean maybe it's just some kind of wrong way of look, looking at the theory, you know? Maybe we just and then and I think that was uh, I mean that was difficult, even though clearly no, none of us bothered too much about it because it was enough that we could solve uh, the hydrogen atom, that we can uh, compute tunneling rates and so on. So of course you can do lots of amazing things with this quantum theory. I mean, yeah, some of these things, some of this uneasiness, you only get over it because you get to know more facts. You learn, for example, about, uh, about uh, double slit experiment or, or or in fact tunneling, that are simply not explainable classically. And classically, a particle that doesn't have the energy cannot go over, go over the barrier. So how is it possible to find it outside? And have you observed any pattern in the generation of your ideas? Do you have a strategy to make them come out? I think like everyone, I know that I need to relax. I need to at least you know, periodically disconnect. It's, it's, it doesn't work just to go to the office from nine to five and uh, and, yeah. and calculate or something. It's, that's usually not the way from it's impossible. In fact, the best ideas they appear in in random circumstances when you're waiting at the at the train station or at the gate for a, for the flight. Everybody says that. <laughs> no, it's 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 because th these are the moments when you are somehow catapulted out of your routine. I mean, you yeah you. You made it to the station, so kind of this is your worry that you missed the train is over. Now you have time, so there's nothing else to do, no distraction. You can, of course, you can look at the people, you can get an ice cream or something, but ultimately, okay. your yeah, your mind is just <laughs> working away. So you might as well uh, think about it. And, and being in, a, in an unfamiliar place, it also helps to look at some problems from a, from a new angle that you mm -hmm. haven't explored. Okay, so that's that's the only constant I observed. I mean, otherwise, it's pretty random. <laughs> And are you, are you afraid of the fact that after having a good idea, it will be difficult for you to have a, another good idea or a better one? I, yeah, so uh, after you finish, you, you look back and of course, if it was something somehow that you could, well, I don't even want to say very important, or very good idea, just something that looks very nice. I mean, the result is very good. And, yeah, then of course you think, oh, why? Yes, uh, it will be difficult to top that. But on the other hand, you uh, you cannot really have this in mind all the time. It's, even if you find it difficult to uh, have a good idea for the moment, you might still enjoy the good ideas that other people had. You, know? you go to a conference okay. like this one, you learn, you hear a lot of exciting things. You know, you can just enjoy learning something new. Does it happen 
often that you think that you understand well um, a concept or an idea and then after some time you realize that you didn't understand it that well? Yes, it actually happened to me today. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> and I'm still very uneasy about it. It's one of the most uncomfortable things to, to come across. Next to discovering that you made an error in a published paper. In fact, that's the, maybe that's the only other thing that's equally bad. And can you explain what was it about? Or? No, it was to do with, um, with these no signaling issues. So okay. we, nowadays we look also at, at situations where you have more than two agents, let's say three. And, uh, and to me, I thought there was kind of a, a very obvious and simple way of, of uh, characterizing, of, of, if you want, defining. I mean, how, um, it's maybe not the right way of saying it. We want to capture the concept that there is no signaling between three parties. And so what can that mean? I mean so it might mean, for example, two of them cannot go, come together and signal to the third one, and so, something like this. And I, th I thought we were pretty clear about what this concept meant, but today I learned something that uh, somehow it seems that my concept and other people's concept were differing, and I couldn't understand at which point they diverge. It's, okay. it's a bit weird. And did you find out? Not yet. No, Not because, yet? Uh, oh. Because we wanted, to <laughs> we wanted to work it out on a specific example, but we were, we were trying to find the, the author of this specific example. It's just to be able to look at some actual numbers to see, to compare my approach and, and their approach to see what goes wrong there. But Do you think at the end of the week you will solve it? Or? I hope so, yeah, no, I, think it's, I, mean, <laughs> I don't think it's a very deep uh, thing. I, just, I was just shocked to find out that apparently we don't agree on, on some very basic concept. It's good that you have this chance of ah, yeah, yeah. being here and indeed, sharing indeed. all of this. Do you believe in Feynman's idea that it is possible to show that you understand something only if you can explain it in a simple and easy way? Yeah, uh, it's a good test. I mean, uh, but the thing is, some people are simply better at explaining than others. I think mean, Feynman is a good example, but even he sometimes lost his cool. And his, he, I, mean, I think there is a famous interview with, uh, with a British journalist where he where this guy asked him about the nature of magnetism. And, and Feynman just says, look, I mean, I can't just say it simply. And Feynman clearly was the one who knew most about magnetism oh, at the really? time. So even Feynman found there are limits. And I, I would think it's true. I mean, you can, in, in fact, you can prove that you understood something also in other ways. For example, if you, if you in mathematics, sometimes you need to understand extremely complicated uh, mathematical techniques to do something. Well, okay, if you, if you can do this, if you can do a calculation, or if you can do something that no one else was able to do using these ideas, you don't have to be able to explain in simple terms. The fact that you could go beyond what other people were able to do, it shows that you understood quite well what was going on. But of course, it's, um, I think it's important to try to, to explain things in very simple terms, simply because we cannot just continue making stuff more and more complicated. We also have to work that, stuff, that our ideas also become simpler again. We need to be able to uh, condense them so that otherwise it becomes more and more tiring to, <laughs> yeah, to but, go to um, new To, to transmit new the, 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 the idea, the, um, the concept, not all the details, but to be able to... Ah, yeah, yeah. No, as I'm saying, it's a, if you want to... If you want, it's a good sign. I mean, obviously, you cannot be... You, you will probably not be able to explain something in simple terms, if you didn't understand it very, very well. But I don't think it's equivalent. I think this one, should, uh, one should view the importance of explaining things in simple words. Sometimes it's the other way around, to be honest. You know, sometimes you don't understand something, and you decide to teach it. And that gives you the enough uh, uh, momentum to understand it, finally. <laughs> yeah, sometimes when you have to teach something, then you understand it better, right? Yes, yeah, definitely. No, it, makes, it gives you a lot of opportunity to think about the details and about the... the and be ready for the together. questions of the students. Yeah, they hopefully come. they yeah. come. I mean, the worst thing is if they don't ask any questions. Yeah. <laughs> the main, the main uh, motivation for me is still the mathematical structure. I like, to, I like to think of it in terms of applications. It's very nice to see that 
Uh, also, it helps you to think about the mathematics, to know that there is this world outside the quantum mechanics that that well, is described by it. Right? Yeah, of course, of course. But the, the thing is, of course, you, for example, my fellow courses on the information causality paper, they are all physicists, all of them. And of course, their motivation is this idea of the foundations of physics. They wanted to know, I mean, how can we characterize quantum mechanics and distinguish it from other uh, wild theories? But in the end, for me, for me, it's a, it's a bit of a game. I mean, there is, uh, it's, a, it's a curious aspect of quantum mechanics. I mean, it's a, it's a curiosity that it's worth pursuing just because it's there. And, uh, and the, same is, I mean, the same is also true with my, I mean, the reason why I went to study science, because I was just interested in puzzles I mean, uh, initially. It's, it's just, you know, when you do mathematics, you, you are confronted with very simple, innocent-looking problems. Still, they are very difficult. And people spend, many people can spend decades on, on the same question without making problems. Yeah. And then one day, somebody has the right idea how to turn the problem such that it suddenly becomes very simple. And for me, this is still magical. This is so beautiful. I mean, uh, when I well, it has to do it has to do with a lot of perseverance. I mean, you have to. I think it was Einstein that said that uh, you have to be prepared to make a lot of mistakes before you <laughs> before you find uh, the right idea, right? And uh, and sometimes without warning, I mean, just like a, like a bolt out of the blue, you you have this idea, and. Sometimes you even know from the first moment, yeah, that's it. That you don't even have to work out many details. You know, you, maybe you sit down later to, to write some formulas just to confirm that it's right. Okay. Somehow, especially when you think thought about something very long time, you, you sometimes you just know it. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I mean, it's, it happens not very often, of course. It's something yeah. that you, you once once you experience maybe every few years. In, in if you continue doing research, I mean, then you have one of these. Epiphany is that something just is right. You don't even, you, it just feels right. Can you go on holidays and stop thinking of physics? Well, I mean, <laughs> it's, there's no contradiction there. <laughs> <laughs> Anything, no, no, uh, there are actually quite a few things. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to be systematic about it. I would say anything that has to do with creativity, actually. I mean, arts, for example, arts interest me a lot. Okay. And music. Uh, so, I mean, obviously there are periods when you, at least for several hours, you have to be able to, to put uh, the science on the second track. Okay. If you go to an exhibition. So you do it something. from time to time. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. sure. <laughs> but vacation is a different thing. Vacation means you go, for example, for a week somewhere else. And it's, I mean, at, after two days, for sure, some idea <laughs> yeah. will pop in my head and I will start thinking about it. Okay, I see. It's, it's automatic. It's a mode of life. I mean, it's... <laughs> yeah, I believe that.